Father Isaac Mary Relia is on the show. <laughs> yes, sir. Father, before before I get into anything, I'm going to ask you to just open us with a prayer, and uh, we'll go from there. And then I have about eight thousand questions to ask tonight, so I hope you're not busy. <laughs> we'll see where we end up. Uh oh, what was the sound? Yep, can't hear him. We can't hear. You. No, no, it was just working perfectly. What happened? It was. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> um maybe he got a phone call oh let's see he might have to sign back in well that yeah, was we'll interesting <laughs> good interview guys have a good night we'll see you guys later. no we were just in the um we were just in the green room and uh i wanted to ask him so many questions we were in there for like 10 minutes yeah you were just going like, off i was like i want I, as soon as i'd ask questions, I go, wait i can't i don't want to ask that right now because i'm going to ask you that in a minute it's like Let's see. I hope he's not texting me. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, he was here. You guys did see it. Um, yeah, it's like, so all week I've been, I've been talking to Father, and it's like, um, when I when you get on the phone with him, he just, I mean, it's unbelievable. You just, you can't, it, it was so strange to actually uh, get a phone call one day, because I, I reached out through a friend to get a hold of him. Mm -hmm. And one day I just get a phone call from Father Isaac. Let's see. I'm going to tell him the. Let's. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send him the link again, just in yeah, case. Yeah, send him the link again. Let's see. Hang on. Let's see. Okay. Brandon. Uh, Brandon's wondering if he checked the viewer count and decided to leave. <laughs> No, Brandon, not everyone is as fickle as our audience. <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's just give him a minute. I don't know what happened. We were in the green room. Everything was working perfectly. He was we were having a conversation. And then, so let's see, I just texted him the link. This is a typical off the rails, guys. You know how this goes. Let's see. <laughs> um, if he we we got 40 on. people in here watching, too. 40 people in here. Everybody that's just joining. We had Father Isaac on, and he lost he his connection. was there. So. Let's just give it a sec. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, this is so bad. I thought I was going to be the mess tonight. I didn't think technology would be the undoing. It's not even on our side, I don't think. No, it's not. It's definitely... Um, uh, it was weird. Like His mic was working. Everything was working. What happened with Joe yesterday when uh, <clears throat> when he came on, he got a phone call. So maybe he, yeah. maybe he got a phone call, right? The phone call knocked out his um... – oh, here he is. Okay. He's back. Let's see if – When you work with me, I wanted to warn you. These things always happen. My video <laughs> guy goes nuts. The, the devil does not want this no, conversation I'm you, my video happen. guy's been in the business 30-some years. He's never had problems until he started working with me. So. All right, well, Father, why don't you open us with a prayer before I okay. open the floodgates? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most compassionate Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection and bore thy help or sought thy hands. The intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin, O Virgins, our Mother. To thee we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise our petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer them. A lady of Fatima, pray for pray us. For us. Saint Pio, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. So, if there's anybody in here that has never, um, who doesn't know who Father Isaac is, I think you're crazy. But if that's possible, um, what happened is uh, early in my conversion, I started off listening to like. Uh, like the lighthouse Catholic media stuff. And then I got introduced to father Ripperger, And then I came across father Isaac and it, I came across father Isaac because of my brother, Joey, my, my brother, Joey adores you father. Like I can't tell you how, how he you're his favorite. So he sent me your conversion story a few years back. And ever since then, I've just been digging for father Isaac videos, your four last things series. I try to watch a different one every, uh, every Easter or Lent. <clears throat> So we're going to put uh, Father Isaac's conversion story uh, in the show notes, and I'm also going to put a Four Last Things link in the show notes. But there's some things in that conversion story that I, when I heard it, I wanted to ask deeper questions about. 
because uh, Father, you you basically tell the story of when once you become a priest and then it stops. But I wanted to know once you became a priest, like during seminary, were there any alarm bells that were there, or did you oh, have a good alarm bells? Forget about it. Sirens <laughs> going off. <there. laughs> I mean, I went to it's called Holy Apostle Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut, because it's for all the vocations. I entered the seminary when I was thirty-one, and what happened is. I didn't have a college degree, so I was able to do college there. I did four years, and I crunched it in three, uh, four, uh, four years into two. And uh, <clears throat> I received my my college degree there, and then I entered my order that I met when I was in Holy Apostles. But I was it was in trouble from day one because uh, Holy Apostles was, had a lot of problems, like most seminaries. But the good thing what about year was that? that? Uh, I entered 1991, and I, I left in 93, yeah. And that's why I met Father Ripperger there. We, we've been friends since, you know. So so, uh, so you start seeing issues in seminary. Now you get ordained. You you, you you decide to become a religious priest. What what made you go the religious priest route instead of the diocesan priest route? Well, number one is prayer. It's the most important thing, uh, you know. Prayer is nothing but a conversation with God, St. Teresa of Avila teaches us. And, and I had the privilege of uh, uh, some, one day my mother came, uh, gave me a book. She said, a lady at a prayer group bought this book for a dollar. And I said, a dollar? So what is it? It was St. Alphonse Ligari, Dignities and Duties of a Priest. So any saint I would devour, you know. So I started reading that. It changed my whole life, for one, because I knew I was being called to the priesthood because there's a big story how I even knew that. But just to answer this question, and, and I realized that your, your vocation, San Alphonse teaches, is connected with your salvation. So God, who before the world existed, he knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb. He chose you, and he chose, you to, and he chose a particular vocation for you whether it's marriage, religious life, or priesthood. And it's the most important thing to discern that. And once you, because he says, if you, if you discern it properly, and this is the problem, nobody really discerns it properly today, very few. And if you choose a different vocation that God has made clear to you that it's yours, he says, it's almost, almost impossible to save your soul because he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your character, your temperament, and he knows what he wants from you. He has a mission for each individual. And so once and so when I started praying, which I once I had my conversion, I was away from God 17 years. And it was it was like unbelievable conversion. I mean, I went from living a wicked life as far morally speaking, and uh to going to mass every day, praying, you know, praying on my knees. I went on two retreats in the first year of my uh conversion and uh, and I God was starting, I wanted to be a priest when I was five. And you know, I was an altar boy. And then once when I'm 13 on, it was a nightmare. I went to this, I was gonna go to a high school seminary, and I went there. There was all these little effeminate boys running around that one just <laughs> cracking the head, you know. And I was a tough kid, you know. So I said, This ain't for me, Ma, I can't do this with these Mary Janes, you know. And uh, so I ended up going to a Catholic high school, which was a wicked place, and uh, it was all downhill. Uh, you know, so being away from God all those years, and then when I had this conversion, it was like I was on fire for God. I mean, all my vices just went away. It was like uh, I was like on this honeymoon where I didn't even have a temptation for four months. It was mind boggling. But Drew, when I did, I started praying, you know, God showed me that this is my vocation, and I would lose my, I knew I would lose my soul if I don't say yes. And I said, I did it my way for all those years, 30 years. It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work, you know. I was miserable, you know, living a life of sin. Yeah, there's pleasure there. You get hooked and this and that. But in the end, it's, it, 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 you know, God created us in his image and like to St. Augustine said, my heart will not rest until it rests in you, O oh Lord. And I don't care what you are. I see people all the time. I look, they live in wicked lives. I just look at it and say, you're miserable. They said, no, I'm not. I say, yes, you are. And I won't back down. And eventually they admit they are. Because you, if without God, you, you're never going to be happy. And so that's what happened. So I discerned and I started reading. And I grew up, my mother was totally devoted to St. Pio. And there was a picture of St. Pio in our living room, black and white. And so my mother was big Padre Pio uh, devotee. And uh, 
she she said he helped it so much because he was speaking out in her time. Because you know, I was born in 1959. My mother had six children, so in the 60s, everybody was contraceptive, and they were my, they would mock my mother in the stores and what's the matter? You don't have a TV, all this nonsense, you know. But my mother, <laughs> thank God, to Padre Pio, she said, "I'll never take contraceptives." You know, my mother was a holy woman. She went to mass every day since she was a young girl, and uh, so you know, thank. So Padre Pio was big in my life, and I always loved the Franciscans. But when I, you know, I never forget watching the, you know, I'm all on fire, and I see a brother, son, and sister moon. I almost put my foot through the TV. I yes, said, this, this guy, St. Francis, he's up on his roof like a hippie with a seizure uh, night count on, chasing some stupid sparrow. I said, this can't be St. Francis. Shut it off. And then when I was in the seminary, I bought the Omnibus of Sources, over 2,000 pages of all the original sources of St. Francis. And if you want to know who St. Francis is, he's no hippie. He's no tree hugger. <laughs> you know, he's a man of God. He was tough as nails. And when I read the, the first, uh, St. Bonaventure, who's a great doctor of the church, he's a seraphic doctor of our mm -hmm. order, and he's considered the second founder. When I read, he has a major minor life of St. Francis, and I recommend everyone read that. If you can read a saint reading, writing about a saint, you're going to learn so much. And St. Francis, it blew me away. He said, this is a man. This is what a real man is. And, you know, most people think St. Francis was like a St. Augustine lived a wicked life. That's nonsense. St. Bonaventure said St. Francis never lost his baptismal innocence. Never. You know wow. what that means? He never committed a moral sin. He was known as a trooper, though. He liked to have a good time, but nothing like people think. And uh, so when I started reading this man and his love for God, he, he wanted to live the gospel with no gloss whatsoever. And that's what the rule was, to live the gospel. Don't water it down. And so that, that attracted me after living a wicked life. I always had this, I was the type of guy, if I'm, gonna, if I'm in, I'm in. If I'm out, I'm out. So it's either all in or all out. And so I said, I got to go. I got to be, I want to be like St. Francis. I want to give everything to God. He's given me everything. What I give, I gave him a nightmare for all those years. I was, I was crucifying and, and now I want to, I want to, I want to do as well. And so when I was in Holy Apostle, there was a particular order at that would totally penitential. Uh, I mean, we slept on wood boards, no pillow, slept in the habit. We did strict obedience. I wasn't even allowed to have water between meals. And I, I went from, uh, you know, I was making good money at that time. I was probably bringing in a good 100000 a year. That was 30 some years ago. Yeah, back in the 90s. And, and, uh, and so I was doing, I mean, I wasn't rich, but I was living good. And, uh, and so, uh, and then I go from that. I was, you know, I had my own company too. I, I, I worked for a big company. I had men under me. I went, gave it all away, and I felt so free and so filled with the joy. Of God, it, it blew me away, and it was simple but beautiful. And uh, but it was some purification, it was, and that order ended up being corrupt to the bone too. And uh, it's sad, you know, because you know. The church is in total crisis. You know, we're going through the passion of Christ, the church, and, and he was betrayed by everyone, you know, except for a handful. Well, the, the, the thing is, uh, two things stand out to me because we, we named the episode where sin, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Because when I heard your conversion story, you do, you don't get into detail, but you, you do give a backstory of how, how rough of a life you were living and and i and it's it's like when jesus says like uh, uh she loves much because she has been forgiven much and yeah. it's, it's, when when sin abounds god's grace really does pour in but the other thing was um your devotion to padre pio stood right out to me because the first time i heard you right away i was struck by how how much your preaching seemed like you were influenced by Padre Pio because you're you're a no-nonsense guy you just get right to the point and so many young men right away are drawn to that because there's such a lack of that in this current yeah era. a lot of them a lot of them run the other way too but I can't <laughs> tell you how many people will call me and they said you know I hated you for years <laughs> and, and uh but I they will in the end they said you were right what you told me I was just running I mean one time I was coming out of my chapel when I was on my last assignment upstate New York and this it was dark and this I hear this voice, Are you Father Isaac? And I looked up and I'm a big guy and I'm not small, you know. And this guy had to look way up. He was like seven foot tall. <laughs> 
two of my two of my hands were like one of his. I said, yeah, what can I do for you? He goes, you came to my parish a year ago and you preached on the day of Pentecost and I haven't slept one night. You tortured me. I said, yes, yeah, so what can I do for you? He goes, I'm ready to make a general confession. I said, it's about time. Let's go. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you know, the truth sets you free and the truth hurts sometimes. You know, those saying the truth hurts. Yeah, it hurts. I always tell people too. It's like if you have an affection in your side and I poke you there, you're going to jump because it's painful. And so sometimes the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And when it goes out, it goes, it never comes back void. And so I've seen some of the biggest conversions with people that I've been spit on everything. And I'm not lying. And I've been slapped in the face, everything. And nobody could have got away with that years ago. You couldn't even come near, yeah. you know? But it was, and when those things happened, I was shocked. I had a joy in me. I was like, what the heck? The joy. I was you couldn't nobody could have got away with that years ago but it's uh my whole point is though yeah there's a lot but today i see i think people are starting to wake up more and more people are tired of going to a priest and coming out more confused than when i went in they have tired of going to a priest and they say bless me if i have sin they, they confess these wicked sins they say and it's the same i uh, say three hill marys three hill yeah. marys father i want to do some heavy penance i did i committed some serious sins and so, yeah, you know, more and more people are waking up and they say, we need it straight up now. And I'll be honest with you, so it, I can't do it any other way. This is what God's yeah. given me and, and that's who I am. And I don't try to offend people, but I'm going to tell the truth. And like I said, I'm a strong believer. The truth will set you free. And we need the truth. I wish I could hear it myself from priests and prelates especially. All we hear is lies. Well, hell. that's a that's that's a good that's a good point. Like, so now now that you're a priest, are there are there preachers that you get excited to listen to anymore, or is it mainly reading and stuff that you do? Or? You know what? Uh, I'm sorry to say, a good friend of mine said, "Father, can you name me five priests?" <laughs> and I said, "Don't bother me." All right? Nah. But, uh, there are good priests out there, but I think a lot of them, the good ones, are underground. I'm going to tell you that right now because yeah. you can't function. In, in the mainstream church today, if you're 100% Catholic and a priest, I would never, how can they give communion on a hand when you know particles are falling on the floor? And it's a proven, it, they, I, we use a pad in the old right, of course, to check, to catch the particles. Mm -hmm. How can I do that? When I know our Lord's stepped on, then he, people are stepping on him, then they come with the vacuum cleaner, suck them up, sweep them up, draw them in the garbage, from the garbage they end up in the dump, our Lord's all over the, in the dumps all over the world. And that's a fact. I can't do that. And so, well, so yeah, it's hard to see priests. Most priests are afraid of the very thing that they're called to do more than anything. And, and I'm not putting myself on no pedestal, but that's to be crucified with Christ. Yeah. It's to be crucified. In, 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 the, in, the, in the liturgy, after you receive the host, the priest has a prayer, you know, what can I return to the Lord for all the good he has done for me? I will take the cup of salvation. That's the cup of suffering. And, you know, we have to be nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. If you're not, you're not a disciple, especially a priest. Not only me, you, and every other person on this earth. And so most priests, unfortunately, they run from the cross. And that's what what's the problem in society effeminate men. men effeminate men are men that run from competition they want comfort they don't want to be conflicted they don't want to tackle problems and they don't want to suffer oh i'm worried about my insurance i'm worried how am i going to get paid i said i'm worried about one thing only. i'm worried about my judgment when i go to see the god and he's going to say where were you would you not pray with me for an hour in the garden what am i going to say to him so, so now back, guys, everybody's asking questions. We're going to do a question segment a little bit later. So keep putting them in. Rob keeps putting them and starring them, and we will get to them. But um, So you come in, and you, what year were you actually ordained? 1999. So like 99, there's no, the indult is very small back then. Like where, when do you first find a See, problem? my order, one of the reasons I joined my order, we, it was Nova Soto. But it was most, uh, the mass was in Latin a lot, at least half of it. We know lay people were allowed in the sanctuary. We received on our tongue, on our knees. Uh, we had altar rails. Uh, no, none of this charismatic nonsense, you know, no uh, Gregorian chant. It was the real deal. And, and you know what? But 
there was other problems that made me leave the order, okay, number one. But when I left, I realized I couldn't survive out there. And I studied more and more and more. I mean, my first entry kind of state being exposed to traditional order was I was in Holy Apostle, a good friend of mine, Mark Giuliano. He was from like the Bronx and we hit it off the first day. And, you know, and he started telling me about the, uh, the traditional mass more. And I always had interest in it. And, you know, I knew that was a mass that Padre Pio and all the saints offered. I said, that's one I wanted to hopefully one day if I become a priest to offer that mass. But then I started studying. Mark introduced me to, uh, you know, certain books. Like one, I never forget one of the first books he gave me to read was The Rhine Flows Into the Time Book. Uh, it was written by a Parini. He's a liberal, a liberal uh, journalist, uh, Father Wilkin, I think it is, and it's a great bo a book. But it rocked me at my faith. I was, I was, I was like, oh, how can this be true? Is this true? And I found out it was all true. It was how they hijacked the Second Vatican Council, the European Alliance, Karl Rahner and his cohorts, all those devils, all heretics. And when you read what happened at that thing, that rocked me. And then there was some traditional seminary seminarians in, in Holy Apostle, but they were pompous and they were cocky and they were they had they didn't have an ounce of charity, so I didn't want nothing to do with them. But Mark was a level-headed guy, and, and so I started going with him. Sometimes we'd go to Trinity Mass in New Haven or St. Agnes in Manhattan. And uh, you know, so I was open to it. But then I started learning more and more, I started reading. In, when I was in my order, books by Michael Davis, you know, uh, it was started reading what happened in the Protestant Revolution, because that's what it was. It was no revolution, it was revolution. Mm -hmm. And when you see that, it, like one thing he said, I'll tell you what, take an old missile and take a new missile and take a pencil. I want you to go through the new mass. And if you were a Protestant, make a little mark every time you would be offended if you were a Protestant. And I'll tell you what, if you didn't use the first cannon, which they butchered to, you hardly have any marks. There are no marks. And after the Second Vatican Council, who the Pope invited uh, six Protestant ministers to advise the Catholic Church what to do to the Mass, what do you think they did? They Protestantized it. They stripped it of anything that signifies sacrifice. And that's what happened. And so when you mark those things down, you come up with nothing. Then you go to an old missile. And you know, have the English on one, and you start making you what you do is make marks because it's very clear there is a sacrifice taking place here now, the same sacrifice, Calvary, but in an unbloody, mystical manner. And in, in, in the new missile, oh, God's my friend, and all this, and the old missile, please have mercy on me, a wicked sinner. What a difference that we come before God on our knees, humbly, like the publican who wouldn't look up to heaven. That's how we have to come before God and beg him for his help. And so they, I started learning more. And then once I was out, I couldn't do them. I had no protection from my order or anything. And so any Novus Ordo Bishop wanted me to do all these abominations. I said, I'd rather die, put me to death before I do those things. I'm not having altar girls on the altar. I'm not having these ladies with mini skirts and, and uh, up on the altar giving communion out. What do you, that's what I gave my life for. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. you know? So I ended up studying. Then I learned uh, I was in my third year, uh, first three years, I offered the new mass, but it was no nonsense. It was mostly Latin. I didn't no abominations. And then I learned, you know, so I've been often, you know, I've been, I'll be a priest uh, for 24 years this August. So I've been offering the, the old right for 21 years nonstop. And I will never offer the new right again. No. You, had, you had a very late conversion. <clears throat> I mean, not a uh, late vocation. Like yeah, a, a late I was vocation. 30 years old. A year later, I entered the seminary, and I was ordained when I was 39, only in August, and my birthday was October. So basically, I was 40 when I was ordained. Yeah. Now, now uh, was your mother still still alive when... Uh... No, that's... I mean, my mother, hmm. my mother unfortunately, she, you know, she didn't tell me till I went to the seminary uh, she took me with this lady, Barbara, who has a lot to do with my conversion, too. In my story, I talk about this lady. She was like a mystic and read my soul and all that. But they dropped me off at the seminary, and, and my mother told me that day, I want to tell you something I never told you. I said, what is it? She goes, I, 
when I conceived you in the womb, I didn't know if you were male, but I said, if it's a male, I consecrate the baby no matter what to the blessed mother. I should but if it's a male, that he would be a priest. And when I was born, she renewed that consecration to Mary. And then she wrote to Padre Pio, 1959, I was born October 5th, and she requested that he would take her on as a spiritual child. And she said, please pray for my son James to be a priest if God wants him to. And so my mother said, I never told you because I didn't want to put pressure on you. Padre Pio wrote her back and accepted her and told her that I would be a priest one day, but she never told me. And I almost, I came <coughs> close to, to death many times, and I'm not exaggerating, growing up on the streets. And, uh, you know, I was, a, I was a big street fighter, no nonsense. And, uh, I mean, I had a car, I flipped over cars, I had motorcycles I rode, I crashed. I should, I should be in hell, there's no doubt about it. If my mother didn't consecrate me to the Blessed Mother, I wouldn't be speaking to you now. And so this gets back to what you were saying before. So the more once forgiven, the more one loved. I said, I said, how can I, you know, how can I do it halfway for you, Lord, after what you've done for me, after you snagged me? And I didn't make it yet. I still got to make it. I mean, we're not Protestants, once saved, always. That's all nonsense. Yeah. That's heresy, you know. And it's well, everybody knows deep down it doesn't work that way. It just no. makes no sense, you know. They fool themselves, and they know it. Okay, uh, but the bottom line is, I still have to work out my salvation, like St. Paul said, with fear and trembling, with fear and trembling. And everybody thinks everyone's just skating into heaven these days. I don't think so. Yeah, and some of them don't even think heaven, uh, hell exists. That the, 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 the funny thing that you're telling that story about your mom is, um, I, I have eight siblings. My mother, um, a couple of years back, she, she said, Lord, out of all nine of my kids, you didn't give me one priest or one nun. A year later, my little sister broke off her engagement. My little sister right now is is uh she's getting ready to profess her vows and she's gonna become a nun. Praise so, God. Praise yeah, the, God. the prayers of a holy mother go very far for any mothers out there that have children who left the faith. Keep praying because they yeah. actually do work. And then when I entered the seminary, my mother started getting sick and uh we they didn't know what's wrong. I couldn't diagnose her for two years. And then when I went entered my order, I was only in there a month. And they diagnosed her with a rare disease. Uh, it's called amyloidosis. The closest thing you compare it compare it to is uh, is is some kind of a form of cancer, uh, leukemia, I think. Uh, but it's not. What it does is just it's too much protein and it just eats your organs one at a time. And so her kidneys were shot. She had to go on dialysis. And, and for for so that six years now, uh, she was literally on the cross and suffered. It was horrible, my mother went through, I mean, horrible. And they sent me home for nine months to take care of my mother. And that was a gift. And, uh, you know, and they told me I'd come back, I'd still go to novitiate. Then the superior changed his mind. But then the, the one of the, the founder came, the co-founder, and they said, no, you're going to go to novitiate. But, so they would let me go see her once in a while. And she was literally on the cross at all times. And she, she was always at a rosary. She never complained. And I used to go up to the to the hospital, New York hospital, where they had the dialysis, she would go and And the doctors told me they never had a patient that no matter what, anything that could go wrong went wrong with my mother. And they said they never met a woman like her and never complained. And I seen those people up in the dialysis ward, they, the windows didn't open. You know why? Because people told me they would jump through it if they, because oh. there's so many things that happen, it's horrible. But she would offer everything in union with Christ. And then she told me on her deathbed, uh, right before she died, that it was, I didn't know it was going to be the last time I spoke to her. And they called me, I ran, I got there, I was a deacon. She came to my diaconate, and then she told me, I, I want to tell you something I never told you. I offered myself as a uh, sacrifice to God, whatever it would take to, to, to save my children and my husband. And uh, my father, he, he was... Uh, Protestant, but he never practiced the faith. And he when he he converted when they married, but he didn't practice. And and the last three, uh, the last year and a half of his life, he had this conversion, and he went to mass every day for a year and a half. Went on retreat, died with the scapular on, and and that back then I used to say I said to my dad, what, what happened to you? What, are you crazy? What are you doing? So wait, this was before you. This was before your conversion. Right, way right before. I, I it took me ten years to accept my father's death. My father died. When I was 20 years old, he had a heart attack in the living room in front of me. I brought him back to life, CPR, everything. They took him in the ambulance, 
and he died on the way in the ambulance. He was only two weeks for his 46th birthday, and my mother was only 43. And, uh, yeah, it's, but she told me that. So she offered that she saw her husband convert, then she saw me convert, and two of my sisters. So I still have two siblings, uh, three siblings that are not practicing the faith. And, and I believe they'll make it just for the sacrifice of my mother, but, you know, I, of course I'm trying to I pick up the ball and thank God for their conversion every day, you know. How did how did that affect you as a twenty year old guy losing your father at that age? Was that was that? Oh, it was very painful, you know, because you know I was I, I loved my my father was a tough 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 guy. When I was young, believe it or not, I was very introverted and very shy, and I was a scrawny little kid. And uh, there's a <laughs> you know I didn't you know I was just very very uh, shy, put it this way. But there was a bully next door. My father was a Golden Glove boxer and stuff, and. He was tough, big guy, and uh, so the next door neighbor was a big bully, and he was older than me. He was a big, heavy Irish kid, and he wanted. To, he was one day grabbed me. He was trying to mess with me. I got away. My sister ran in and told my father the kid was going to beat me up, and so I came in. My father grabbed me by my. He goes, "Where are you going?" I didn't tell. Him. Oh, I'm coming in. No, you're not. He goes. He goes. He grabbed me by my neck. He goes, "Listen, this kid's gonna. He's a bully. And a bully, you got to fight. Whether you lose or not, it'll never bother." He goes. So I said, I don't want it. He goes, you're going you're gonna to do it no matter what. So he grabbed me, dragged me, called, called the kid, Sean, you want to kick my son? Bye bye. He goes, yeah. <laughs> and this kid was like twice the size of me. And he threw me at the, pushed me at the kid. The kid came at me. And I don't know how I did it till this day, but I whooped that kid. And that was, that, that was changed hard. me. That changed me like you have no idea. From that day on, I was a fighting machine and nobody could come near me and you know back then everyone had long hair my father take me every two weeks for a crew cut you know <laughs> back there on the head and they get a nice pop in the head then. and so i started fighting then when i was young and, and from that day then my father always told me you don't start nothing but you finish it you understand he taught me a little how to box a little and uh and then then it was like the devil got in there because i was like a magnet from from that age on wherever i went I could sit in the middle of nowhere, somebody would come and pick a fight with me. Yeah. And uh, the mob wanted me to work for them, to be a collector, everything. I could have did that stuff because that's how big of a reputation I had. And I was, I was bad, you know, with my hands. And I didn't, I can honestly say it, I didn't start. Most of them I did. There was a couple maybe I started, but um, I was the worst thing that, in one sense. But, you know, God writes straight with crooked lines and only God could take something evil and then turn it into good. And mm -hmm. so if, if I didn't have that training, now God didn't want me beating up people like that. Maybe he, he don't mind you defending yourself. But, I mean, I was hanging out in bad places, I mean, rough places. Man. And, uh, but if I didn't have that spirit in me, now I fight, I fight for God. Because I had my conversion, I promised God. I said, I promise I'll never hit anyone again. And I never did. And uh, it's, it's, oh, 33 years now, whatever. No. And, uh, right, but right, I yeah. fight for him now. I, I wouldn't be able to get through the summer. I wouldn't be able to do what I did with, you know, fight, you know, the corruption in my order. And it's tough. It's tough, man. But you know what? I, I fight, but now I'm fighting for God. You know, uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, David and Goliath when he's up against the judge. He goes, you know, you come before me with your sword and your shield, but I come before you in the name of God of Israel. Yeah. Go ahead, Robbie. Now, I, I know... Um... That kind of that fighting spirit, that uh, that fighting masculinity is really important to you, and I know your your given name is James. How did yes. that? Uh, how did like that that fighting spirit impact the name that you ended up choosing as your religious name? Well, it's interesting because one day after my conversion, my mother said, "Can you clean the basement out for me?" Uh, so we had this room, this little. Uh, so she had a lot of books from school and stuff, and. So I got a dumpster and there's a little window because we lived in Queens, you know, houses on top of each other. Yeah. So I'm drawing all these books out the window and then and then I go outside and then draw them in the dumpster. So I'm out and, and I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm losing my mind. Pick that book up and I see this book turned upside. I said, God, that's my imagination. So I'm, I kept on hearing, not a voice, but in my pick the book up. So I turned it over and I was like shocked. In the picture, the guy looked like me and, uh, it was St. Isaac Jones, a North American martyr. And mm. I, I, I read that, I devoured it. It was like a 25 page. 
I said, oh, this, holy smokes, this, this is, a, uh, what a man that he laid his life down for the Indians. He came over here not for the land of milk and honey. He came here to, to bring Christ to souls. And one of my favorite stories I could tell you about him is like, he was, he was a prisoner of the, of, the, uh, of the Hurons for over a year and a half. And they treated him like a slave. They would beat him, they tortured him. And, and they would use him as like to, when they would go on trips to, he would have to carry all their gear and stuff. And when he would come into a village, any of the sick that were dying, he would go try to baptize. And so he came into one village. They said, outside, there's a vill in the village is a, uh, uh, you know, Indian man, he's dying. We kicked him out because his wounds are so bad. It smells, you know. So he went there and he went in. They had long houses, the Hurons. And when he went there, the stench, he almost wanted to vomit. And the man had maggots coming out of his wounds and everything. And St. Isaac Job's clean his maggots and clean his arm and he's talking to him about Christ. He wants to baptize this man before he dies. And the Indian says to him, you don't remember me, do you? And he looked at him and he goes, when they first captured and they had to run like they call the gauntlet, there's uh, Indians on both sides with uh, pipes and wicked weapons and they would beat you and you had to run off. And if you fell, you keep beating you till you get up. To, and then they tied him to posts and they, they knew how to torture the American Indians. And they worshiped the devil too, and, we, and it's proven. You just read the writings, and they would burn it. You know, they would burn his skin, and they were cannibals. They would take his skin off and eat it, and they pulled all his finger, some of his fingernails. They cut a couple of his fingers, and hmm. he says, "I'm the one that cut your fingers off that day." And you know what Saint Isaac Jones did? He looked up to heaven. He said, "Dear God, thank you for giving me the grace to return." <laughs> love for hatred and then he said to the man will you be baptized and he said yes and he took some water from uh from corn stalk it was in the morning and he three drops of water and he said he baptized him and then indian went straight to heaven that's a man mm -hmm. people have this misconception especially in the modern era that the american indians were these just nomadic peace lovers like they they really were i mean it was demonic worship they don't realize how how, I mean, you look at like in South America, they were sacrificing children. And if it wasn't for the church sending missionaries out to actually convert the, the, the new world, it would be a very different place we're in right now. Yeah, it's, and, and you know, when you read it, it's, it's a shame too, because when you read it, you can see how they, the, the medicine man would keep them in bondage. And they were afraid because they knew it was the devil. If they didn't do what he was told, then he would send the devil after them. So they would go by dreams. That's why I tell people all the time, you see people with these dream catches. Those are from hell. Get that out of your car, out of your house, because it's bringing demons. And uh, But... But that's what we're called to do. What was the, we just, okay, here we are in Easter, right? And what's the first command in, when God gives the apostles before he sends into heaven? Go to all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and teach them everything I have commanded you. It's, a, it's not an option. And that's since the Second Vatican Council, where it, 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 we, the, the church, not the true church, but the, the, the mainstream church has lost its zeal, this missionary zeal, that there is no salvation outside the one holy Catholic apostolic church. There is none. It only makes sense. St. Paul says only one God, one baptism, one faith. How can God support all these different Protestant uh, beliefs? There's, there's like thousands, 70,000 different denominations. It's ridiculous. They well, have to fight with each other. They keep splitting off. We all believe different things, and they all think we're going to heaven. No. If, if there salvation. is salvation outside the church, then there is no reason to evangelize. There yeah. is no reason to convert people. And then, and Christ was a lie. Then, you know? Yeah. You know, and uh, and and it's it just makes sense because first of all, God's all good is all love, and if you're all good, all love, and you can't deceive or be deceived, He's omnipotent, omniscient. You can't deceive Him, and He won't deceive you because that's not charity. He wants you to get to heaven. So how can he support all, it said we're all going to heaven when we all believe different things. They don't believe in the Eucharist. They don't understand what our Lord meant when he said three times in, in John chapter six, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood or you will not have eternal life. Three times. I mean, and, and you know, so this is important. We need the zeal. And that's why, you know, 
this is de almost dead and extinct in the church. Very few believe, even traditionalists, because they say every priest has one sermon. I would say that's my one sermon. There is no salvation. It's the fundamental dogma of the church that's being denied. Yeah. And I preach that. Let me tell you something. As a priest, and you preach, you could tell what strongholds the devil has very easily. Because when you start hitting him, if I come up to you and I give you a nice right, and I'm going to drop you, it's going to, you know, you know, that's it. He knows when you're preaching what will set souls free. He knows it. He knows what's, what's good, what hurts him, and you could tell. So, you know, I preach abortion, contraception. I'll preach everything because I'm obliged to. Because I, I truly love souls. I'll, I want to lay my life down to help get people get to heaven. And so, the, but there's two, there's two things that I preach that the devil, he goes berserk, berserk. The number one is no salvation outside the church. Why does he go so crazy? Because it's true. It's true. And he has everyone duped. And the other one, I can tell you, I don't know if you want to get into that. Most people, they oh, really, on, let's go. <laughs> but the other one, okay, when I was in, I was blessed because when I read that book that my mother gave me, that the lady at the prayer group gave her for a dollar, it was the best dollar ever I ever received. Uh, St. Alphonse, if you listen to any of my talks, you could see that people say, man, all you do is quote him. Yeah, because he's one of the greatest, the greatest. And so I prayed after that book. I said, Blessed Mother, if you want me to be a priest, your son wants me to be a priest. I don't know how you're going to get this done, number one. Uh, <laughs> I said, but if I do, when it comes time to study morals, I want to be able, I hope you, I need a professor to teach me St. Alphonse, because why? I learned that St. John Vianney said he didn't become a good confessor until he read St. Alphonse's books. <laughs> he wanted to be greatest confessor to the church, and guess who else? Padre Pio only followed St. Alphonse in the confession. I'm a very simple guy, very simple. I said, that's it enough for me and i said please bless the mother when i made my first vows after novitiate you start studying theology and guess what they sent this holy and he was he's one of the few men or only men that i ever met him that i would call a saint his name was father alphonse son and he taught us nothing but saint alphonse for morals he lived breathed and eat saint alphonse this guy was a living saint and when he would talk about the saints, uh, the martyrs, he would cry. He, he, man, but I mean, tears of, he loved God so much. And he taught me all St. Alphonse. And, and I said, so I adopted that right away. And the church, the Holy Office, made a statement, and I could back it up, that any priest that follows St. Alphonse, and they mean follow him properly, cannot err in a confessional. Cannot yeah. err in a confessional. They don't give that promise to even Aquinas and all that. So I said, that's a no-brainer. So St. Alphonse, he was teaching us one day in, in morals, when you're going over the commandments, that it's sinful for parents to allow their children to sleep in the same bed together, sister and sister, brother and brother, brother and sister. They're not allowed to sleep together in the bed. And when I, he didn't go into details because he was very prudent in a lot of ways, but, and I heard that, I said, you know what? The holy doctor says it, I know it's true, and there's a reason I'll find it. I couldn't figure it out at first. And Father Alphonse, the, right before we were ordained, he wouldn't give it to the floor, gave us a pack of notes uh, that involved delicate stuff. And, and so he says, you don't open this till you're ready to hear confessions because you don't want temptations, this is delicate stuff. But you have to know it. And so I started finding out right away why St. Alphonse teaches that. Because young kids, they're below the age of reason, too. So when you're below the age of reason, you can't commit a moral sin, right? Because your will and intellect's not developed. If they're sleeping together, the body's the body. And things happen, all right? Then they end up with this bad habit. And then they grow up. And so you know how many people have come to me in my missions when I preach that? People want it. Some people want to rip my head off, but other people tell me, do not stop preaching that because that's what happened to me. When I was a young boy, a young girl, I slept with my brothers and sisters. One thing led to another. We didn't know what we were doing, but I ended up with a bad habit. I ended up living a promiscuous life that took me down a road to hell. And one day I was teaching a, a, a class for converts, and I'm teaching this, right? And this big uh, 
what do you call it? Uh, a, there was a Marine in the class. <laughs> and he just slams his fist down. He goes, that's BS and this. And so I let him talk. I said, I said, listen, watch your mouth. But you could say what you have to say. I have no problem. And I'll, and I'll explain it to you. And I'm ready to explain it to him. And there's a young lady in the class. She said, Father, well, may I say something before you speak? I said, sure. What is it? I can't believe this is coming up today. A good friend of mine, he's a social worker. He has 150 cases uh, at one, uh, of young teenagers. And he just told me today, so many of the teenagers that he has told him that their problems go back to when they were young and they slept in the bed with their sibling. And so it's real. And then I explained it to a little more. And, but let me tell you something. So all you parents out there, now you can't commit a mortal sin unless you know. You have to have yeah. uh, sufficient knowledge. That, but once you know, please don't let that happen. Don't let it happen. And and they should. And they're not allowed to be in the parents' bed either, unless you're you're, you're breastfeeding and weaning a child. You know, so the child is weaned. But these. And but let me tell you, I know what a stronghold was because of the the kickback that I get. Yeah. It's on. So that shows me a lot of souls are going to hell because what's the the worst sin to commit is not sins against the flesh, six to nine. A lady told since, uh, uh, bless, uh, Saint Jacinta that both souls go to hell for sins of the flesh. And so I tell you, if you're fighting the war, it, are you going to use your best, most effective weapon or, you, or your least effective one? Of course. So the devil's not stupid. And as a priest confessing now for 24 years, and I, when I was doing my mission steady, I would hear confessions 12 to 16 hours a day, and that's the honest to God truth. And some, most people don't believe it, but it's true. I get past it to back it up. And that's no credit to me. Give it to God. But I tell you, it's true. Most souls are going to hell for sins of the flesh. Well, even even the <clears throat> my initial reaction when you said that, I was like, really? That's a thing? But I, the more I'm thinking about it, two little kids in a bed don't like they're innocent doing yeah. something but but something happens and all of a sudden well, something, like, when, when you're young if something feels good you want to do it right you but, give a kid it, an ice cream it tastes good he wants more ice cream and, how and they, often got, do you, they don't have the tools to deal with this yet you know what i mean and how, and how often do you hear that people go and have you know, um, they, they struggle with certain issues in their life with lust or with same sex attraction, all because of something that happened to them when they were little. Yeah, and they didn't it's constant. The, and the most, these are some of the most troubled souls, especially, uh, God forbid, it happens, unfortunately, in our society. It's rampant. A, kid, a child that's been molested, man. It's, it's horrible, yeah. man. But those innocent kids like that, when they do, is two kids. So this is why, you know, so. I preach it to save people pain. I don't preach stuff because, oh, Father Isaac just wants to get in our face. No. You think it's easy getting up there doing it to bring it? You know, look at the prophets. I'm not telling you I'm a prophet, but they told the truth. And what was the reward? They put to death. I hope that happens to me for the sake of for the gospel, for Christ. And, but the thing is, I know the bondage, what I have to do. It's, it's one of the hardest bondage to break. When you're into the, the sin of the flesh, you're chained by Satan. And, and people don't understand the very sins that you're afflicted of are, are the sins that will t they torture you. And if you go to hell, and most people are there for sins of the flesh, St. Alphonse says, and if, and if there's uh, people there that are there prominently for another sin, at one time committed a sin of the flesh, he says. I mean, you know, so, it's so bad. You hear you hear confessions of of traditional like uh, you're in you're in you're in our world, <clears throat> so obviously you can't reveal what goes on in confession. No, but, but you could talk in general, right? That, so, what do you think? Like most of us in this world, because you're, we're not, <clears throat> we always hear you know so the other side saying we're rigid, we're this, we're that. But what do you think? <laughs> our real sins that we really need to be working on. Oh, as, it's as, very easy. You just we just we're talking about. See, one of the faults, unfortunately, about not all traditional, but a lot of them very prideful. And you know, God punishes pride with with, with love, or with sins of the flesh too. Mm -hmm. It's a punishment. You're in love with yourself, you know, so you deserve all this pleasure. So trads are just like hey, listen. You think up until the Second Council, everyone was uh, traditional because what? Being traditional is being Catholic. Let's face yeah. it. Either you're in or you're not. Either you accept everything or not. 
And so up into the council, we always had the old mass, but we, you don't think we had wicked sinners? So that's one of the, the uh, 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 some of the people in tradition, so many think, oh, because we're, they're in tradition or just because this priest offers the old mass, that means you're, no, that doesn't mean you're Catholic. You're going to struggle like anyone else. And we're living in the most wicked times. I mean, we put Sodom and Gomorrah to shame, what's going on in our society today. I mean, yeah. to shame, you know. Uh, it, it, so you got to train yourself. You have to train your little ones. And, and you can't put them in a bubble. I've seen that too. I know people, they wouldn't let the, the, the 18 year, 17 year old boy go to the mailbox because they're afraid of the junk mail that comes or they won't let them go shopping in Walmart with them to check out because they may see some. No, you got to train that kid. No, we have to practice custody arts. When we see something not proper, we don't put ourselves voluntarily into an occasion of sin, we call it. But there are necessary occasions to sin. So, no, the, the, I would say those are the two big things with most traditionalists: is pride and uh, sins of the flesh. Yeah, I think I think our, I think the tendency is to think, oh well, we go to the traditional mass and we practice these traditional uh, devotions and stuff. And I think a lot of people are are missing what those things are supposed to be doing for us. And you do; it's very easy to go from the um the prodigal son to the older brother and here's the thing i'm sorry to break the bad news to the traditionalists in this sense because our lord says as you judge so you will be judged number one number two uh you know as you given. judge so you will be judged but the thing is i tell them your judgment the more you know the more culpable you are so most traditionalists thank god and that's one of the things i love because tradition, once again, is to be Catholic. Most of the traditional people, I go, I love going to the parishes. These little children in the second grade know more about the faith than the average adult that's 50 years old. And that's not the truth. I said, so you know more, the more know, the more demanding out of you. We got less excuses because we've been blessed with the proper catechisms. We you listen to uh, you know, good priests. On, on the internet telling you the truth, you're going to be judged by what you know. And, and we, not only that, we're obliged to uh, to keep on studying our faith. We're obliged. It doesn't end with confirmation. You know, so some people really, they don't study no more. And, and uh, you have to continue to study because the more you know about God, what? The more you can love him because he's so awesome. What, what do you think people that are suffering under some of the edicts out of Rome right now with the restrictions on the traditional mass, what, what can some of those people do? Can, you think they should maybe practice more devotions at home, things like that? What do you what do you think people can do in well, this situation? Well, the thing is, too, away? the number one, too, you know, we really have to strive for holiness. We have to take it serious. Our Lord says, be holy as your Father in heaven. He is serious. He doesn't say things like we do and we all know. He means it. Be holy as your father. So he's serious. And, you know, he gives every, it's the te church teaches that every soul, once they reach the age of reason, which is normally seven, some reach a little earlier, some a little, but it's average seven, you receive all the graces you need to save your soul. So first of all, it's, it does start with us. I always tell people, don't think that one person can change the world. We just talked about my Holy Father, St. Francis. Look, you, how many men became Franciscans? How many, how many women became Franciscan nuns? How many souls we won't know until the general judgment, and that's one of the reasons for the judgments to, to balance the scale, are going to be in heaven because one man named Francis said yes to God. So we've got to take it serious. We don't want to be pompous. If you think you're a saint, it's the first sign for sure that you're not. You know? <laughs> And uh, so, so the bottom line is we got to be really men in prayer. Like I give talks about this all the time. What do we do in our time? Number one, we're, we're warriors. We're soldiers of Christ. Once you're confirmed, you are. So that's why the bishop would crack you in the face, you know, because you deny our Lord in your intellect. And that it's a sign, no matter what adversity, no matter what, even if they dread me to kill me, I will not deny Christ. And so if you're not going to, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to stand at the cross unless you're a man and woman of prayer. 
you have to go frequent to sacraments. The, if you could go to daily mass, it's the most awesome thing, the greatest gift on earth, to receive our Lord in his body, blood, soul, divinity every day. That's the greatest. In the early first 300 years of the church, when they were slaughtering Catholics, slaughtering us, I mean, the Colosseum and everywhere, those Catholics who were caught out of mass, they really put to death. But guess what? They would not miss Mass. Every day they, they knew they needed the Eucharist. If you can't go to Mass every day, and I, and I understand a lot of people will, uh, have determined I will not go to anything but a traditional Mass. Make spiritual communions then. And the spiritual communions are powerful. St. Alphonse says if you do a spiritual communion, you receive almost the same graces as you if you actually receive communion. That's a powerful statement. But the more spiritual communion you do, the more desire, your heart will be on fire and thirst for the Lord to receive the Eucharist. And that's why I love, like, when we study history, the St. Alphonse says that the devil has always used heretics throughout the history of the church to do what? To suppress the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He, will, he has always, I'm going to repeat it, used heretics to suppress the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And he says what he goes on to say it's a punishment for our sins. Punishment. Well, well you think you think back to COVID, right? And uh, I, we got to be careful. Obviously, we're on YouTube, but there was that period where they did take the sacraments away, and I I remember that period where we were making spiritual communions at home for a few months because mm -hmm. they shut the churches down, pointing to what you just said about. They take the holy sacrifice away, and it's a punishment. But I remember this longing from every single member of my family, this longing desire to go and receive our Lord when they finally let us again. Yeah, and you know what? you got to continue doing those, even if you go to Mass every day. <laughs> All days, St. Alphonse has a beautiful formula for it. You don't have to use this long, but I love it. But the bottom line is you... You, you need that. That's number one. The Eucharist is number one. That's like the vision of St. Don Bosco of our times. You have the boat, which is the church. You have the Pope leading the church, and then it's anchored to two columns. The Eucharist is one, Our Lady is the other, and of course the Eucharist is higher than Our Lady. Those are our anchors. Those is, that's where our salvation, she's a star to see. Just like navigators on the sea, they would use the stars to guide them home. She guides us home. She's the mediatrix of all graces. And I am such a big promoter of everybody praying the rosary. When Our Lady said pray the rosary, I believe she meant the three mysteries, the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious, because that's the full rosary. Okay, 15 decades. And I challenge everyone out there, and people take me up on it, and they laugh, because at first they say, you're crazy, and then they find out I'm not. It's easy to pray three rosaries a day than one. And I, I don't, it sounds crazy, but I do do it. And the people tell me, they, some, I get feedback, it's not all the time, but I do, and they tell me, Father, I, since we've been doing three rosaries a day, our life has changed. The, the, the graces are pouring in. We can't even believe what's happened to us. I did a, I did a, I did a mission uh, in Jersey somewhere not too long ago in the last year. It was the year before, and a lady with fourteen children came up to me and she said, "I want to thank you." And she said, "We listened to your talks and we took your challenge." She goes, "All fourteen children, and me, my husband and I, we do three decades a day." And she says, we can't afford to stop. And God will do that for you too. Because when our Lord, our lady gave the rosary to St. Dominic in the 13th century, and she told him this, and this blows my mind. I don't think people get it. I don't, I don't get it enough. She said, this is the preferred weapon of the Holy Trinity. The preferred weapon of God, the Holy Trinity. Uh, what else do you need to hear? Yeah. I, I want that weapon. And then at Fatima, a lady told Sister Lucia that her son, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is given a deeper efficacy for, to the, for the rosary in our times. This is the weapon for our time. So if you yeah. want to strap on your 45, fine, I don't have a problem with that, but you better be strapping on a rosary too. You better be praying those beads and you're going to see your life change. Well, especially because when the first 
uh, thing that you said about what, what, especially men in the trad movement are struggling with. I mean, I, I've heard other priests tell me too that the, the sin they hear the most is what men are looking at on their computers and things like that. And for me, uh, that changed for me when a priest gave me the penance to set my alarm for three o'clock every day. And he told me at 3 p.m. at the hour of mercy, I want you to stop what you're doing and pray the rosary. And just having that practice at 3 p.m. at the hour of mercy every day, that is what actually was helped me root that out of my life. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's so powerful. And it's the thing that the devil trembles. Because at the name of Mary and Jesus, all hell, and I mean it, all hell literally trembles. All hell. So you want to come after me, you're going to pay. I'm going to, I'm going to pray, pray, pray. And that's it. And that's our weapon. Not us. It's our lady who crutches his head. Her and her seed. Who's her seed? Her seed is Jesus Christ, second person in the Holy Trinity, who took flesh. But those of us in the church that are baptized in the church are part of the mystical body of Christ. And so Christ is the head of the church. We make up the mystical body. And what connects the head to the church? The neck. And our ladies call the nexus. And so we were in the womb of, with Jesus in a mystical way, those that belong to the mystical body of Christ. And so we're in this battle, and our ladies calling us to enter this battle, to be part of her militia, to help crush the head of Satan. Not prideful. But to do it, and we have, and this is what she wants. And the victory is everything comes through Our Lady. There's not one person in heaven who's who's dead is not there because of Our Lady. Not one. And that's why the devil, these poor Protestants that, that disrespect her and even blaspheme her, shame on them. And the devil those who want them to come to, to Our Lady. And this is powerful stuff I'm telling you. This is it. So this is a weapon, and we got to do it. All just start. Start in the morning. Get 10 here, 10 here, 10 there. You, you're going to see it's a contemplative prayer. It leads you into contemplation. You're meditating, too, on the mysteries of the life of Jesus and Mary. St. Louis de Montfort said there's two. Rosa will make you sing, but there's a couple of uh, defects that most people have. They pray too fast. Number two, they don't pray for the virtue they're most need of and they don't meditate on the mystery so if you're struggling out there would say lust and pornography the internet you pray please but some mother when i do this show grant me the virtue of purity all right and get in i want to mention this because this is important this is insane all 100 percent when i'm going to tell you saint alphonse this is one of the biggest problems not only in the tradition in, in, in the mainstream church but in the traditional church and I'm going to say this, and they get mad, but most traditional priests haven't been trained properly in the confessional either because they don't teach St. Alphonse no more. And so there's what we call, St. Alphonse called, uh, calls a recidivist sinner. A recidivist sinner is a, a someone, a man or woman, who commits a mortal sin, goes to confession, confesses it, and sorry, and they, they do it again. And then they go to confession, and they confess it, and they do it again. And they do it again. And again, he says by the third time, usually, usually, and there's there's some uh, usually not 100 percent. Most of the absolutions from that point on are not valid. Why? Because when you confess, you promise when you do your act of contrition to amend your life. Right. And if you're not amending your life, you're not sorry. So I explain it to men, especially I've given, I've given a lot of talk at men's uh, conferences. And I said uh, it's it, it's an allergy that hits you in the face. I said, God forbid if you went home and you found your wife in bed with someone and she said she was sorry, so you know the marriage is indissoluble, you forgive her, and you, 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 things are going good again, and then you come home another day, she does it again, and she does it again, and, and I, I go to the yell to the man, is she sorry? And they all yell out, no! I said, that's right, and neither are you. Because you keep on crucifying Christ every time you go on that internet. You you keep on crucifying. I said, so what do we do? I got St. Alphonse. He's awesome. He says, a confessor, he has, he's a physician of the soul. And a physician of the it's like being a physician. What happens when you go to a doctor? What does he do? You go to a doctor because you're sick. You go to a doctor because he has to diagnose your disease. Okay? So that's what a good confessor does. He diagnoses your prominent vice. And then, he, like the doctor, a uh, uh, physical doctor, doesn't just say, hey, you've got cancer, go home and have a nice death. He gives you a prescription, a remedy, an operation. 
And this is what the priest is supposed to do. He has to uproot, uproot that wicked vice so that you will never want to commit that again because otherwise you're going to go to hell. And so a good priest knows how to do that. He has to delay your absolution. Right, like not giving you absolution is not a punishment. It's a mercy. It's to, to well, let you know, hey, look. but the thing is, the thing is, I say, say Alphonse teaches you how to how to do this, and he could, I could give you a thousand absolutions, my son, but is that he ain't gonna forgive you? Now you have this false impression. And I tell men when I give these talks, I say, how many of you men are entangled in this vice? And I can see them all shrinking. How many of you men are going to mass? You go to confession, some of you four times a week. You're doing a rosary and you'd say, does this stuff really work? Because I'm still committing the same sin. And you're ready to despair. You're ready to throw the towel. In. But I got good news for you that that's, there is a way. And St. Alphonse, our God gave us him as a doctor of church for morals. And I tell you, God, thank God. I, I can't thank Father Alphonse sub, sudden teaching me what he taught because that I've been able to help set thousands and thousands of men free and they still write me and thank me because they never thought they could stop they never thought they could stop and don't fool yourself men or women because the women are getting worse than the men and a corrupt woman is worse than a corrupt man and a simple one. don't it's happening all over it's happening and and, and we got to really take grip on this and, and, and here's the thing, even in traditional circles, I hear priests, they say, I can't stop my young men from doing the porn and this and that. I said, okay, I'll tell you, I'll show you how to do it. I'll teach you what I know, what was taught me. And you know what? They won't do it. You know why? Because you get complaints from your bishop. You get complaints from your superior. You know why? I tell them, I don't, I gotta take complaints from them than complaints from God. Because I tell the penitent, I have a soul too. If I give you absolution and I'm not supposed to, I'm gonna fry. And St. Leonard of Port Maurice, there's a great book out there. I, I recommend you all buy it, give it to your priest, give it to your confessor. It's called Counsel to Confessors. Loretto Press sells it, it's only like seven bucks. It will change the priest's life. He tells a true story in St. Saint Leonard of Port Maurice. He was a great Franciscan missionary. Read his sermon on the number of those saved. You want to be shaking in your boots? Read that. But he tells a story in there of a wealthy man who was committing adultery. And his wife said to him one day, you, do you think your absolutions are valid? And you know what he said to her? Shut up. What do you think? You're, you're a theologian? He goes, my confessor's a theologian. If they weren't valid, you think he would keep doing that? So not long after that, he died. And one day she went into the chapel and this hideous figure appears in front of her. It's, it's like a monster in flames, all flames. And she went to run. He goes, no, this is your late husband. And she goes, where are you? He goes, I'm burning in hell. She goes, who's that carrying on their shoulder? Because he was on top of someone's shoulder. He goes, that's my confessor. He has to carry me and all the penitents that he kept on absolving when he shouldn't have. Wow. And... And I have to, I burned here because I kept going and committing the same sin and not amending my life. And you could say, I don't believe that. I don't care if you don't believe that. You're hurting yourself because it's the truth. Saints don't lie. So it's a, this stuff is, a, this is so serious because yeah. in the traditional circles, man, it's rampant. These young boys, I'm, I'm telling you, they're all, and not only that, they commit the sins now. At eight years ago, it was more like 13, 14, now seven, eight. Yeah, because there's so much access to it. And it's like, that. look, you want to know what a lukewarm Catholic is? A lukewarm Catholic is somebody who's using the confessional like a revolving door. Yeah. Like that's... That's what I got talks on the YouTube. That's it, the revolving door. I get talks on that. I did talks to young men. They all put their head down. But guess what? I, I was at a conference somewhere and I gave that. And you should have saw there was the devil starting right away. I was up preaching, and it was over 300 men. And this guy gets up and starts. He would turned out he was a Bible dumper. He said, "That's not from the scripture." I said, "Excuse me, sir, sit down. If you have questions, we'll talk after the talk." And he 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 went wild. It took six men to get him out eventually because he kept jumping up. And I told the men, I said, "Listen, the devil doesn't. You're about to be set free or have an opportunity to be set free for the message I have to give you." And this is why this is happening. 
So I'm going to give you the message. And after that, I heard confessions the rest of the day, over eight hours, and we had to go home. And what happened is they had four or five other priests hearing confessions, and the guys running the conference, my friend was one of them, uh, the line was forever. And, and the other priests were almost yelling, there's us here too, what do you come over here? And they all shook their head, no, we're going to follow I did. You know why? Because they wanted to be set free. Yeah. They they had the very problem that I was there for. Yeah, the very problem. Rob, why don't we get to some of the audience questions? Because uh, I know yep. we got we got about fourteen of them lined up, and I know I, I know we'll wind up being here all night if we don't start asking some of them. So, okay, so we'll we'll start with the quick one. Um, what is the the statue of of Mary and, and the child Jesus behind you? Oh, that's a good one. It's Our Lady of Good Success from Quito, Ecuador, uh, in the 16th, uh, 17th century, and 16th appeared to Mother Mariana Torres. And I recommend uh, you go online. There's an apostolate uh, friend of mine. Her name is Kathy Heckenkamp, and uh, she runs the Apostle for Our Lady of Good Success. And you could get the books, the prophecies on everything we're living now. And I tell people, they knew that the Vatican would lie to us about the third secret of Fatima. So she reveals a lot of it too, 400 or 300 years before she came to Fatima. And Mother Marianne is incorrupt, and plus like 12 other nuns from that convent are incorrupt to this day. And I mean, the prophecies, I, I have talks on the internet, and you could look it up, Father Isaac Mary Raya on Our Lady Good Success, an hour and 20 minutes, and I go through the prophecies are devastating. And so I promised Our Lady and, uh, that I would, in a devotion to her, and, uh, you know, I've read Mother Mariana's Life, Volume 1 and 2, and I've read a lot of uh, saints. She's not canonized yet, but she will be. She was such a uh, victim soul, uh, I highly recommend it. So I promised I would have a statue made in her honor. And, it's a beautiful one. This one behind me is the actual size of the Blessed Mother. Because when she appeared to Mother Mariana, she, she told Mother Mariana to take her Franciscan cord off, like mine here. And she grabbed one end of it, she put it to the top of her head, and she told Mother Mariana to mark it by her feet because she wanted the statue made her exact height. I think it's 5'6", uh, if I'm not mistaken, or 5'4", maybe. And not only, so this statue, just to make it real quick, they got the best artist, and he wanted, he said, in order to do this for the glory of God, he prayed, he fasted, but he went all the way to Spain to get the best paints, and then he he wasn't, he was ready to paint the face finally and the skin, and <laughs> you're right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah my camera's gone. So <laughs> he was ready to paint that, and that night, Mother Mariana saw St. Michael, St. Gabriel, and St. Raphael came with St. Francis, and they finished the statue. Oh, so wow. it's magnificent. Uh, uh, read it. Look into it. It's a great devotion. What, uh, what sort of prayers and mortifications would you suggest that we offer for, for modernists, um, especially in our own families? Well, here's the thing. I think the best way to do it, I follow... Uh, uh, friends, uh, uh, St. Maximilian Colby, the great uh, Franciscan saint, and St. Louis de Montfort. And they promote, of course, true devotion, uh, uh, consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary. When we uh, Consecration means set aside for holy things. And so Christ comes to us through his mother. He wants us to go back to him through his mother. And she's the mediatrix of all graces. So when we consecrate ourselves to her, we give her all our merits. Anything we do, when you do anything in the state of grace, you receive merit for it. If you're not in sanctifying grace, you receive no merits for anything. And so, but when you're in sanctifying grace, you have merits. And so a lot of us, I used to do, I'll pray this rosary for my brother, my sister to be converted, or somebody dying. And at first it was hard because St. Louis the mom would say, Maximilian would say, no, you give it all to our lady. It's hers. And what happens is we have impure motives. Nobody's pure on earth except for our lady she was. And she, once it becomes her, so say I do a simple act of, you know, act of charity, so somebody helping someone or something, I give that merit I receive for that to our lady. Now it becomes her, 
And now she purifies that, and that, and it becomes much more valuable in God's eyes. And then she applies it to where God wants it to be applied, because she knows what God wants. And so there could be a soul right now dying in China that, that God needs another sacrifice or something. Our Lady knows that, and that grace will go there. And so maybe at first it was hard, because I said, but what about my family? What about this? And it really set me free, because I, you still pray for your family members. But you you give it to Our Lady, and she, you can now outdo Our Lady in generosity. And so the best prayer you could do, number one, once again, the highest form is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Go to Mass. Every communion that I receive, every St. Louis the Mafia, St. Maximum, we give it to Our Lady, say, I, we give it to her, it's hers. And say, please do this what you will. And we just, but I still beg her for my brother, my sister's conversion, and other people. And, and so that's number one, uh, the rosary, the rosary and the mass. Now, I'm telling you, what, just, you keep that rosary going and you consecrate yourself to our lady. When you get to heaven, there's going to be a whole army there that you got there, that you too. See, our lady participates in the salvation of every soul that gets there. But we, oh, we, we, get, we have to get ourselves there with God's help. We can't do it out. But we can also get other souls there because our lady of fatima once again told us jacinta and francesco and sister lucia most souls go to hell because no one will pray or do penance to them so we got to pray we got to do penance we have to fast and the most and, and we have to give good example because if our words don't match our actions they mock us they ridicule us because let me tell you something if you're really catholic you're going to touch people they may mock you. Somebody, at, uh, you'd be surprised. The person at work that mocks you more than anyone, when they're in, when they're struggling and something's going bad, you know who they turn to? The person they think's closer to God. Mm -hmm. The person they see makes the sign of the cross every time they eat before they eat their sandwich. So your example is 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 so important. Your deportment in life and charity, of course, we have to be charitable. <clears throat> What's next, Rob? What, what, what next question? Um, so this is actually from from my own wife here. We have uh, two young two young sons. Besides writing to Saint Padre Pio like like your mother did, what are some ways we can encourage them towards the priesthood? Number one, uh, your example, your ch God, you parents should tremble literally tremble in your boots if you wear boots and shoes whatever because the judgment you're going to go through too i have to go through severe judgment as a priest again i'm not looking forward to it and please pray for me and all priests but you as parents god is giving you too a gift to procreate what a gift and he gives you a soul and he entrusts his soul to you why to populate heaven to make saints to get to heaven and so how are they going to be a saint and say, if you're not living a good life, if you're not, if they see mommy and daddy, I have kids come to me all the time. My mother and father's a hypocrite. Everybody thinks they're a holy role. I'm not saying this about you or your wife or anything, but they go, you got to see the way they really are once they get out of church, you know, pray on Sundays. It seemed like the, you know, the devil on Monday, you know, and there's a lot of people like that. So you got to give them the example. You as the head of the family, this is the problem. The woman have the curse of Eve on them big time because the woman wants to run the show today. The woman, like Eve, Adam didn't want to give, didn't want to deal with her. It's easy to give in to her. Take the apple. He took the apple. He should have corrected her. No. And so my, many men I see today are totally emasculated. You know, it's true. The women are wearing the pants. And when you reverse the role that God has established, you bring chaos into the world, into your family. So the men have to be the leader of the house, especially spiritually, and the father. And, you know, they got stats. I, I don't have them in front of me. You see the stats of women and men without fathers. 75% of all men and women in jail have no father figure. And then the mother has to fulfill her role. The, mother, the, the man is the head, he's the king, but the woman is the heart of the family, the, the queen. And so you gotta fulfill your roles. How many married couples do they even know about marriage? Most I find when I get married couples, I help. I say, okay, this is what I want you to do. There's a great uh, website called uh, the, uh, the Nazareth Catechism. 
It's awesome. So on there, they have catechisms. There's five of them. Pi, Saint Pius, uh, uh, no, first Saint Thomas Aquinas. After Aquinas, it's Saint uh, the Catechism of Trent. After that, they're all next to each other. After the Council of Trent, the Council of Saint, uh, the Catechism of Saint Pius the Tenth. After that, the Baltimore Catechism. And the, the last one I wouldn't bother with, it's the new one. And I can tell you why, because it's never seen it yet, all right? And, uh, but what's nice is, so you go down to marriage, and then you click, let's read St. Thomas. And then you go next, let's read the Council of Trent, which is the greatest council the church ever had. Infallible teachings, infallible. And then you read the, uh, St. Pius X. And, and I told him, read this. Start knowing what your vocation. Read the great encyclical, Costi Canubi, about married life. And sit down, because, and then, you know, share that encyclical. Say, okay, let's read the first four chapters at the end of the week. You and me, we're going to sit down, and, and, and you tell me what you got out of that, honey, and then I'll tell you. And then you, you're going to grow, because you have to know your vocation in order to fulfill what God has called you to. So no, study your vocation. And then the other thing is to Im imitate the saints. The great saints that were married, imitate them. The, the mother and father of Saint Teresa the Little Flower, Zelly, Saint Zelly, and uh, I forgot the, the father's name right now. But anyway, they were third order Franciscans. Read their lives, you know? And, and so with your children, that's another, read them the saints. That were, the saints are, is better than any movie you could watch. The stories of the saints are magnificent. You see, one of the great books I, I, I really recommend in our time is The Victories of the Martyrs by St. Alphonse Liguori. The Victories of the Martyrs, he gives the history of the martyrs from the beginning of the church, the first 300 years in the first part. The second part is the Japanese martyrs. And we need to have the spirit of martyrs to live in our time because we're living in the age, they're going to start seeing martyrs in the United States because they're coming. We live in a communist country. Whether you accept it or not, you can't change the truth. It's communist. Our lady warned us of Fatima. Russia will spread our religion out the whole world. So we got to read that. And you see, we have to pray for the spirit of martyrs. And there's one, I forgot, I got to look it up because I want to read it again myself. But I that got me through my novitiate. Every day I would read one of the Roman martyrs and then one of the Japanese. And they never forget, they went to this man's house. They were going to put him to death because he was Catholic. And when he came, he said, yes, can I go put on my best clothes? And they said, yes, because they had honor the Japanese. And he comes down with his best uh, clothes, right? And they get on your knees, deny, he wouldn't deny Christ, whatever. He cut his head off, with a, you know. And then his little five-year-old boy goes, I am Catholic my, like my father. You must cut my head off for Christ too. They said, get on your knees. He did quap, you know. And your children need this to hear this now because yeah. we don't have to walk in fear. The worst thing they could do, the best thing they could do is take our lives, a martyr goes straight to heaven. But this is what's missing in the church, the spirit of the martyrs. And I, you know, getting back to, I don't want to jump around, but when I was talking about how the devil uses heretic to suppress the mass. When the English suppressed the mass in, in, in not only England, but in Ireland, you'd be put to death if you were caught out of mass. Those great Irish people, I love the Irish, they would wake up their family at two, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and walk in the, they would have it. And, you know, back then they didn't practice contraception, eight, 10, 12 kids. In the woods, they would walk pitch dark for two hours to find a mass rock. They knew where it was. And a priest would offer the mass, and they would have guards on the outer perimeter. So if the English would come, they would warn them. If you would be caught at that mass, you would be put to death. And so I say to people, what, would we go to a mass like that? Me as a priest, I as a priest, would I offer the mass knowing that that penalty could come down upon me right now? I hope the answer is yes, and I don't presume I could do it, of course, without God's grace, but what a way to go. When I went to Ireland, we found an old map, and we went looking for mass rocks, and there was one of Father Mayor on Christmas Day. He was all ready to offer the mass. He said, if the English come, take the sacred vessels and run. And right after, when he, right in the middle of mass, they came, the lady took the vessels, the, the pattern and the and the uh, <clears throat> chalice, and she dumped, drew it in the lake. Till they fished it out, 
And to this day, they offer the holy sacrifice of the mass every Christmas with that child. That's what we need today. We need, it's coming, my friends. We brought up what happened at COVID. Shame on the prelates. I mean, shame on them. The shepherds, they carry a crozier, a rod, to beat off the enemy, to beat off the wolf. And they handed us over to the wolf. Yeah. And you know why? Because they received over $3 billion in the first year. Go, going back to even what you said about husbands and wives and husbands being the, the leader of the home, I, I, I read uh, St. John Chrys Chrysostom with my wife, which is very harsh towards women, telling women a lot of things. And when I read that with my wife, my wife received it with such like an open heart. You'd be amazed how women will react when they actually hear the truth. Yeah, because the other thing is your wife, obviously, is probably a woman of God. She wants to know the truth. And that's why I tell I tell the feminists, you, you you guys are miserable because you're fighting God, what God created. Once He establishes an order, it cannot be overturned. I don't care. If you think you're a guy and you're a girl. You can't change that. You know all this nonsense that's going yeah. on in our society today. And His way. Look, it took what Saint Thomas Aquinas has a question: Why did God wait four thousand years to send the Messiah from the sin of Adam? Till when Christ came. You know what one of the main answers is? He said it took 4,000 years for the Jews to realize they cannot do without God. Yeah. So we got to wake up. Well, look at, there's such parallels what's going on in the church and society today. And the old saying is, as the church goes, society goes. And that's why our country is God. All Christendom is God. But the good news is, and, uh, you know, we're coming, you know, Easter is about the resurrection. It's about hope and Christ conquered death. And we are living, I recommend reading Blessed Bartholomew Holzenhauer. And he's a, he was a great, he had prophecies that are spot on. And he tells us there's seven ages of the church. And we're, we're in the end of the fifth era. The fifth era started with uh, an age of the church, started with the Protestant Revolution. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an age of total heresy, apostasy. And that's where we're living now. And the fathers and doctors told us that the apostasy will come from the top down. And that's where it's coming from now, from the top down, where the head is poisoned, the body's poisoned. But we got to hold on. We got to hold tight. And we have to have hope because we're coming to the end of the fifth. And that will be the great chastisement of Fatima or Akita. And after that, it's going to be spectacular, spectacular. And I mean spectacular age where Christ is going to raise up the great prelate that Our Lady of Good Success talks about, too. In, uh, in the 1600s, she talked about it. A great prelate that will renew the church and the priesthood. And there will be a great monarchy. And they will... Uh, all religions will be gone except for the Catholic religion. It'll be a total rebuilding of Christendom. And and Our Lady of La Salette tells us, unfortunately, now in the last 25 years, and then we have the reign of the Antichrist three and a half years. But your children, I believe, are maybe going to be these children that God's going to... St. Louis the Moffat says, in the end time, God's going to raise up little ones that's going to do greater works than the apostles. And I think these may be your children. And, and out there right now, I see these little ones. And this is a tip I want to give you getting back to your wife's question. And I, 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 I'm glad I'm remembering it. I tell parents, number one, once from the day your baby's born, you should pray that rosary, a family rosary all the time. But always pray that your child will never lose their baptismal innocence. That means they'll never commit a mortal sin and that your child will answer the call that God has called him or her to, the exact vocation, and will do that they have a whole spirit of holy indifference, which means it doesn't matter what I want on with God. And let me tell you, I have kids that have been praying that for 30 years. I've not no longer kids. What a difference I see in these people. Because God, in the Bible, right, he says, I will give you your heart's desire. If your heart's desire is to be holy from when you're a little kid, you're praying that rosary with mommy and daddy. I want to be a saint. I want to be a great saint. And, and you keep praying that, God says he's going to give you it. I believe it. And you're taken to the sacraments. You're reading the lives of the saints. Those are their heroes. And, and you'll see he's raising that army up now. 
Yeah, and especially during a time when when the the, the priesthood is in such shambles for the most for most people. I mean, it's very yeah. rare you get Father Isaac, right? Like men, we have to be the priests of our home and take that role so seriously. You know, and, and it's the other once again, Saint Al, you know, Saint Alphonse says it's like it's one of the greatest gifts God could give you is a good spiritual director, but that's almost unheard of. And so he says, if you can't get one, because it's better off, he says, not having one than a bad one. Saint Teresa of Avila will tell you that too. But then read the saints' writings, and though they will help, God will help guide you through their writings. It says in the Bible, only a fool guides himself. But when there are no guides out there, then you have to go. My moral professional, I told you, I, I know he was a saint. One time he was going back to Rome. I said, Father Alphonse, do you have any advice before you go back? He goes, Yes, my son. He says, Never waste your time reading good books. So I was looking, because I know he always has a golden nugget coming. And he says, only read the best. And by that, I mean the doctors and the fathers and the saints. He goes, you'll grow in wisdom and knowledge. You won't have time for no nonsense. And that's my advice to everyone. Only read the fathers, the doctors, and the saints. If you don't have those was, initials was before there, you... Was there, a, was there a particular uh, life of a particular saint that really stood out to you besides St. Alphonsus and Padre Pio that you oh, think... Oh, yeah. I mean, I could go, you, you have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, so they're asking for book recommendations. Yeah, but... like well, St. Vincent Ferrero is one of the all-time yeah. greatest okay. saints. He raised more from the... He was uh, called the Angel of the Apocalypse. I mean... I could tell you stories about it. he. I wish like somebody like Mel Gibson, who's talented, would make a real movie on him. It would blow away anything out there. You know, Saint Ignatius of Loyola. I mean, all the good founts, Saint Alphonse of Gurb. Uh, I could go on and on and on. The great saints that we have, you know, that are so so inspiring. Uh, Saint Paul of the Cross, the founder of, of the yeah. what do you call the Passionists. I mean, these are my heroes, St. Louis the Monfit. I mean, I, I, you know, see, notice a lot of the guys I pray to are what? Missionary preachers. And and that's what happened. My order, I was just ordained. They called me, one day, they told me, listen, you got to go give a, 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 a mission. I said, when? This weekend. I said, wow, I have no time to pay. They said, just shut up, do what you're told. That's how it was. <laughs> and so I said, what am I, I got no time to prepare. So I went, it was a, a parish in New Jersey, in, in Connecticut. And I said, what am I going to do? I'm going to do what all the saints did. The missionary saints preached on what? Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So I get there. There was this old Monsignor. He was the pastor there for 28 years, a priest for 50. He was an Italian, you know, Paisan. And so I told him a couple of things over the phone that I wouldn't do. And he didn't like it, right? So I get there. He says, uh, come on, before we go, we're going to go out to eat. And then, you know, we're sitting there. And then he tried to rip into me, <laughs> you know. And uh, so that didn't go too well for him. And I said, listen, that's the way it is, you know. And uh, I won't get into what it was. But anyway, so the bottom line is I told him, listen, I start tomorrow night. Show me how to lock up the church. And he started laughing. He said, for what? I said, because I'm going to be in a confession all night. Because you don't know what you're talking about. You're a newly ordained priest. He goes, I've been having missions in this parish 28 years. I've never seen a missionary go over an hour. I said, it's going to be different tonight. He goes, no way. So I preached around 6 o'clock at 6.30 that night. And uh, well, I could tell you, I got out of confession 3.45 in the morning. His the, his priest assistant was almost cursing me because he, <laughs> he had a lock up. So the guy was blown away. So every night I was hearing confessions like 12, 16 hours every day. And it was, and God showed me that's what he wanted to me, you know. And people responded because they don't hear about this no more. They don't hear about the four last things. You know, I got to tell everybody, if you've never heard Father Isaac's uh, Four Last Things series, he does. there's a whole bunch of them on YouTube. But that, uh, my friend Ian, actually, uh, when I told him you were coming on, he said that, that your Four Last Things series changed his life. So if, if you guys haven't seen or heard any of them, please go and check them out. Um, I want to ask Ashley's question because that's also my brother's question. Um, if what what should a wife or a husband do if their spouse is a non-believer and whose largest sins are pride or selfishness or anger? What, do, would you would you suggest well, specific you know what? prayers? And it's tough, you know, because that is a cross, and this is one of the problems with you know with your vocation. If you're called to marry, most people don't even discern that. But then 
if you are called, the next question is, who do I marry? I said, you don't want to marry a bum who's not going to help get you to heaven. So the first question I say to somebody, uh, is that person going to help get you to heaven? You know what they do? The average person laugh. I said, then you shouldn't marry him or her. But now that you're married, you know, and you do are stuck with a spouse, because everybody thinks they're going to change somebody. No, most of them change you. And you're not allowed to go. I know I see Catholic women or even men that are married to a Protestant. They go to a Protestant service. That's a moral sin to do that. It's you're, not allowed. you're not allowed to go to other forms of false worship because that's what it is. So you're going to have to wear your knees out. You're going to have to probably suffer like my mother. And I, I, I tell you, I can't wait to see my mother to just thank her. That what she went through was... She was hell, you know. And when I used to see my mother, I go up to the hospital sometimes. I used to say, I wondered, because my mother always had the rosary, and everyone saw it. And the more she prayed, guess what? The more she suffered. There was a man that had a, he was a big uh, Mario, his name was. And Mario had to. Uh, see how he big, says Mario? Mario, uh, uh, he, he ran <laughs> big, he ran Padre Pio groups, you know. And Mario had the glove of Padre Pio, so I, I'd have him come and bring the glove when my mother was in the hospital. So one day she was suffering so bad, I said, Ma, you want me to call Mario? She goes, no, no, I, I, I can't take more suffering at this point, you know? <laughs> and because she would get, after blush, she would suffer even more. So I said, I wonder if these people think that they look at my mother, that maybe they run farther from God because they see the more she pray, the more she suffers. And you know, God taught me a lesson. And uh, so we lived in, I, my mother, she died. She was in Corona, New York, Queens, and she was laid out there. And so the first time, you know, we had, back then you would have, uh, it started in the afternoon at two, two to five, you go home and eat and come back. Man, the lines were out the door for two days. All the doctors from that hospital were lined up, nurses, aides, fellow patients, and they were all, touched by my mother's sacrifice yeah and, and so it's tough but you know People what are it's, worth to holiness. It. it's worth it though you know how to, and you know what you you just we got to just you know our lady will hold our hand you i always tell people you if you're not going to be devoted to our lady you're not going to stand at the cross you're not of oh, course saint john was the only apostle that didn't flee out of all the apostles why because he clinged to our lady you have to cling to our lady. I, she owns me. I, I, I beg her. I help her. She's always with I, I call on her all the time. I beg her every day. Blessed Mother, strike me dead before I betray your son. Because I know I could betray him. St. Philip Neri, I got that from him. He used to pray every day when he woke up. Dear Lord, keep an eye on Philip. He may betray you today. Imagine a saint like that. He, and that's what we need. When I hear people say, I'll never do that. I said, you're going to. Yeah. We have to have a fear because you commit one mortal sin, you're capable of being or turning into an animal worse than Hitler. Yeah. And then this, we're going to get the, well, uh, Jenny's, Jenny asked, um, I don't know if I would phrase it like this, but she's asking, how often do you, uh, to speak up when family is involved in heavy sin? Like, I don't know if the approach would be to bring no, up I understand. Their sin. It's a good question, a very good question. Okay. We're obliged sometimes to defend Christ in this church if someone's blaspheming. But there's a rule. We don't don't give fraternal correction if you know the person is not open to it. And you know why? Father Alphonse taught me. He says, because sometimes it brings more sin into the world. So I knew one time I corrected someone from blaspheming, and I knew the person wouldn't be open to it. Unfortunately, I didn't know the teaching that. You know what they did? They blasphemed 10 times more. To, to get me more upset. And it broke my heart because they were offending God. So the thing is, my like my mother, she used to, she always talked to me, but then she came to a point where she just would renew my consec like the consecration she made in me to Our Lady, renew it, renew it. And it was through a prayer and penance that really moved. Uh, I know that's what it was. Uh, and it's going to be, you can't, what are you going to keep on confronting? But you got it too. This is the problem too. Like, like, say you you're married, you got, and you have a brother who's wicked. You can't have him come into your house if he's going to be using foul language in front of your children or doing bad things. You, this it's painful sometimes. You have to say, you know what? 
Tommy, whatever, I'll meet you for a cup of coffee once in a while, but I can't have you do that in front of my kids, you know? And you got to use prudence because you can't scandalize. Our Lord says, better a millstone wrapped around your neck drove you into the depths of than to scandalize my little one. But there's nothing more painful than when our loved ones are away from God. It breaks my heart, I told you. I have two two brothers and one sister. I'm on my knees. I beg our lady. And, and, and that's what I have to do. That's what you have to do. Once again, most souls go to hell because no one pray or do penance. Who wants to pray or do penance? But we have to. Yeah. And then Aaron, this is a pretty easy question. I Oh, did we lose him? He's probably getting a phone call. He might be getting a phone call. Sometimes that when you get a phone call, it black it blanks. Oh, they, would you get a phone call? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised. I wanted to shut that off. I forgot because usually his phone is crazy. So uh, Aaron's asking, which I think is a pretty simple answer to this one. Uh, what is Father Isaac's opinion on Archbishop Lefebvre and the SSPX? Archbishop Lefebvre, without a doubt, was a saint. A saint. All right? Yeah. And uh, all I can tell you people is this, too. Uh, first of all, they're not in schism. Pope Francis has even given them universal jurisdiction to hear confessions. A schismatic doesn't get that, all right? Yeah. So people don't even know this stuff. They use terms, and this is the people that don't know what they're talking about. But I'll tell you what, when we went through this last three years of disaster, when they shut the churches down on anyone, they didn't shut theirs down. So yeah. you know who the true shepherds are when they come. Now, there's no utopia on earth, and everyone has problems, and you're going to see that. But you'll never hear heresy from those men. You'll, you'll, you go there, the, the true mass is offered with reverence and respect. You see families, gr big families there. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I, I, I recommend them highly because in the end, you know, you're going to have no place to go probably. So. Yeah. Um, Brick is asking, um, is that, do you, do you have any, uh, specific, uh, prayers for the spiritual communion that people might be able to have if they, if they're Latin? Well, you can look up, noise? just type in St. Alphonse of Glory, but it goes, you know, uh, my Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament. Since I can't receive you now, come at least spiritually into my heart. You pause for a minute and you could do whatever you want. And then you say, I embrace you as one who has already come. I unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. <laughs> so I'm telling you right now, you read everything that St. Alphonse wrote. And they have a book. It's yellow cover, Visits to the Blessed Sacrament. It is gold. Read oh, Preparation for Death. Read all his books of gold on, on the Eucharist. Read all his books uh, you, you're never going to do better because when you read St. Alphonse, he quotes fathers and doctors of the church constantly. It, it, there's nothing better. There's a, if you Google online, there's yearly meditations. He has a, uh, they put together for the liturgical year according to the old calendar. And they're online. I, I could send you a link to them and you could put it up there. And every day you go according to the old character calendar, there's meditations for the morning and then there's a uh, spiritual reading and then meditations at night and i have men i said read the, at least a spiritual reading to your family after the rosary and when if you stick with that for one year it's going to take you through the whole spiritual life from the purgative to the unity of it you're going to be hearing quotes of saints and stories it will transform you transform you Father, you have uh, you have a way of like I, I guess people think that you're brash. I, all I see is a man whose heart is on fire for God, and I, I'm telling you, you had such a significant part in my own conversion. I'm so grateful that you came on with us. I hope you come back on with us again. Rob, did you have anything that 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 you wanted to get to? No, I just, um, I just wanted to bring up this comment here that someone else who who you were in, instrumental in their conversion is listening. So, yeah, yeah, uh, priest, listen, I've. I get feedback, not too, every once in a while, you know, God, he does uh, let you know, keep going on. But the, I've even had uh, Satanists have been converted from those four last things. Protestants yeah. have been converted from, and, uh, and I always tell people I've talked to, they never give up on a soul. I don't care if they're a prostitute, drug addict, alcoholic. We have to fight for these souls. I don't care 
if it's President Biden, because he is an apostate, Nancy Pelosi, that witch, they're evil. <laughs> they're evil. They're yes. evil. And they put, a lot of them, I believe, are, are practicing Satanism. Mm. But we have to pray for them. I don't want, we shouldn't, we can't want anyone to go to hell. Why? Our Lord shed the price for them. He shed his blood for them. Why should the devil win? But we have to have that zeal. If we don't have that zeal, if we're not willing, we have to be, first of all, get our own soul to heaven. And that's what I'm saying. If you start doing these things, reading St. Alphonse and reading other great saints and doing, doing, here's the thing you have to do. I want to add, besides the mass and the rosary, when I take someone under my wing, say that really wants direction, but most people don't. Those are the things I insist on. If you could do daily mass, it's number one. Number two, the three, three mysteries a day and a half hour mental prayer. Mental prayer, you can't become a saint without it. And, and, and St. Alphonse has a great book called The Great Means of Salvation and Perfection, where he goes over mental prayer. It's a treatise that he refuted the Jansenists. It's like gold. And other saints, too. Uh, but you got to do mental prayer. Mental prayer is where you have nothing but a conversation with God. You set aside St. Teresa of Avila, the doctor of prayer. If you do one half hour a day in six months, you will go to a whole nother plateau in your spiritual life and and you you could become a saint and you can't without it and I'll, I'll, i could go on and on but mental prayer say bernard says is like looking in the mirror what happens when you look in the mirror you see your image sometimes it's not nice right and so when you pray god starts to show you who you are and as a gentle father in the beginning he he you know he brings you to him he gives you consolation especially in the beginning because we're like little babies. He has to, you know, bring us in with the, with the candy. And then he eventually starts drawing back the sensation, you know, because he starts showing you your defects so that you could you could grow, you know. And But if you do it, you'll become a saint. It's awesome. And he'll guide you, too, in your mental prayer. He'll start pointing out to you, why did you speak to your wife like that today? Why did? Why were you too hard with your son or your daughter, or you, things like that? And, and you say, "Oh," you, you start reflecting. Yeah, I am, and then you you change, you know. And you pray for the graces you need, John. Not to pray. I can, but the, we we can give a whole talk on that. You know? So maybe maybe that's what we'll do. Maybe we'll have you come back on and and, and talk to us about prayer because yeah, when, whatever, when, you, whatever, you know. If I, I can I, help, oh, this I can was help. just such such an edifying conversation. It's so rare we get a chance to actually speak to somebody who's. As on, I mean, you told the story about how you were on fire when you were younger. You still seem like you're just as on fire for Jesus as you were back then. So, uh, you know, uh, you pray for me. I need a lot of prayers. A lot of prayers. Well. <laughs> you know what Saint Alphonse says? It's scary. One priest, one priest receives more temptations than a hundred lay people combined. So, imagine a hundred. Lay people, all you and 99 others, or two of you and 98 others, all of your temptation, the devil. Why? Because, you know, we could say we're the captains. We're not the generals. That's the, you know, the pope and then, you know, the other, the other officers, the bishops. But he comes for us because St. Alphonse says one good priest, one, brings thousands to heaven. One bad brings thousands to hell. Yeah. And so we need prayers. And, you know, I know people get upset, and there are. The church has been infiltrated by the Masons, by the communists. And that's why we have a lot of these homosexuals, a lot of these uh, scandals. But this is all part of the devil's plan. But there's a lot of good priests out there. There's a lot of priests suffering. Because, believe me, the good ones have been exiled. The good ones, you know, they have a group now called Council Priests. I don't, I don't have any association with them, but... Uh, it's happening. You, if you're good, if you're not canceled today, you better hold that guy in suspect. That's all I'm going to tell. Yeah. <laughs> we actually had uh, one of the canceled priests on uh, Tuesday. <laughs> Father Lavo. <Lovell. laughs> yeah, Father Lavo. He came on Tuesday. Yeah, so we really need the prayers. And here's the thing. You can't get to heaven without a priest. That's the way yeah. God made it. I didn't make it that way. And you know what? I can't get to heaven without a priest either. I still got to go to confession. I try to go every week. I still, you know, I need guidance, you know, which is almost impossible today. Yeah. But, you know. So. Father, I, well, two things. I want you to come back on. And then also, next time you're on Long Island or New York, 
we're, we're getting together. So, hey, did you meet my buddy, brother? Bernard? I didn't. I actually wound up going to Holy Innocence that Sunday, and I and I and I didn't get to meet him. But I spoke to someone who knows him, and next time I, I'm going to wind up catching over at my St. Michael's maybe this Sunday. You got to put it, put him on your show. He's great. That yeah. You're, so the person love. I talked to, said and he's that, a yeah. he's a paisan. He lives. He's taking care of his father right now. So, dear <laughs> I want to point out to everybody that father says Mario, not Mario, like you animals. Yeah. It's Mario. It's not Mario. Because they all say Mario. I said, no, if I, my friend Mario, if I ever called him that, if I ever called him Mario, he'd punch me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on, guys. And uh, You uh, want to take us out with a prayer, Father? Yeah, I'll give you a blessing. Pax et benedicta de unipotente. Pace, fili, spiritus, santi, descende, super gross, minet, santa, amen. God bless. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much, Father. Take us out. Father, you can stay on. We'll talk in the green room for a minute. Rob will take us out.